everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. The second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul, my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of your life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being, therefore, a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise from the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel? Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and mercy and peace be to each one of you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. It's Trinity. Sunday. I don't know, uh, some people maybe don't look forward to Trinity Sunday because they know we're going to do the Athanasian Creed, which is really long. The, past, the, the, the service goes a lot longer than we expect. But it's, it's crucial that we do this because our faith and understanding are not in some generic God or just any old God, but in the correct God, the true God, as he has revealed himself. I know I've used this illustration before, so forbear me, uh, uh, please. But you might have a wonderful braking system in your car. A braking system that is entirely worthy of your trust that when you step on it in an emergency, your car will stop. But if you step on the gas or the clutch instead of the brake, it's not going to stop. You have to stop on the, step on the right pedal. And you have to believe in the right God, which is the trying God. It's crucial, but it's also compelling because it exposes the reality of a God who is complex, that God is beyond what we can understand. 
You know, if you look at the Muslim concept of God, I hate to say it, but it's a very simple kind of an idea of God. Just kind of like the idea of God you would have if you made it up. But nobody would make up this stuff about the Trinity. It, why? Because it's beyond our comprehension. And in fact, God is beyond our comprehension. It's crucial, it's compelling, but it's also comforting. Because we understand what God has done in the con we understand who God is in the context of what God has done for us. And that brings us to our text. My text today is the Acts chapter 2 passage, which Isaac read for us a few moments ago. You know, in theology, we talk about, we have these fancy words. We talk about the idea of the imminent trinity, which is the persons in the Godhead in terms of their relationship to one another, compared to the economic trinity, which are the persons of the Godhood in, uh, as understood by their relationship to uh, history and to, to a human being. And really, the economic trinity is a lot more exciting. You know why? Because that affects us. That's talking about what the persons of the Trinity have done with regard to us. And that's why I love this passage from Acts chapter 2, because it tells us what God has done, the persons of the Trinity. And you'll see why this is needed to bring comfort and reassurance when everybody else in the world is going to be facing terror. So I encourage you, take your, take your programs, open them up, to the passage in Acts 2 so that you can follow along some of the things that I'm going to share with you this morning. While you're opening that up, I want to tell you a little story. Because years ago, when I was assigned to a Marine Corps unit, we had a fellow come. He was a retired Marine. He had gone on to become a, a professor, an academic. Um, and now he was going back, making the circuit through the Marine Corps uh, as a public service to come and tell groups of Marines about the struggles that he had with alcoholism back when he was active duty. He was a very effective speaker. He had marvelous stories. And, and he made a huge difference in helping Marines who may have been struggling with alcohol to get help for themselves. Really powerful. But I remember one story in particular that he told because um, he had drank so much when he was on active duty, he frequently had uh, blackouts. And he did it so much he could wake up the next morning after being blacked out the night before and just go to work and just it, it didn't even know or think about it. So one morning he's getting ready to go in and someone contacted him and said, you need to go see the commanding officer. He wants to see you right now. Well, the night before had been a social for the officers. And the guest of honor was Chesty Puller. I don't know if you know that name. Every Marine knows Chesty Puller. He was a famous Marine war hero. And our young Marine officer in question had had a, a blackout. Now, if you ever have even just one blackout, a period of time that you don't remember because you drank too much, it's a problem with alcohol. You've got to get some help. But he had this blackout, and in the middle of the blackout, he got into an argument in front of everybody with Chesty Puller, saying that Chesty Puller had not deployed his tanks correctly in the Korean War. So the commanding officer was calling him in. It was time to give an account. He was going to go up before the judge, so to speak. He was going to face a little justice. If you watch TV, you've probably seen some of the people holding up the signs. No peace, no, ju or no justice. No peace. Well, the day is going to come. That may talk about our horizontal dimension, but in our vertical dimension with God, the day is going to come when they and many other people will stand before God and be saying, Oh God, please do not give me justice. So while you look at your passage here from Acts chapter 2, uh, it's the second part of the sermon that Peter gave on Pentecost. We heard the text that gave the first part of that sermon last week. Before we start digging through it, I just want you to go right to the end. Go to verse 36. Do you see that? Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So this sermon by Peter is going to lay out for us how God the Father has made Jesus Lord and Christ. Christ, and it's going to highlight what those mean for us. Verses 22 to 33 will show Jesus as the Christ. Verses 34 to 36 will show Jesus as 
the Lord. And for each one of those roles that God has uh, appointed to Jesus, Peter uses an Old Testament scripture. For each one, he uses the expression, this Jesus. Isn't that a funny way to talk about someone? This Jesus. But it spotlights the particularity of Jesus. And for each one, he stresses that it was God who has done this in Jesus. And for each one, there is a warning call of repentance to those who are listening to this sermon, because this Jesus is the one whom you crucified. Did you see that in verse 36? And if you look back to verse 23, you see the same thing. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So let me just start with that, if it's all right. I learned early on in preaching, it's normally a good thing to group myself in with the hearers. And so normally you'll hear me talk about how we have sinned. And Christ died for our sins. It's usually not a good practice for a preacher to go, you have sinned. My dog knows that this is not a good sign. <laughs> but not for Peter. Now there may have been some people present who actually were there uh, more than 50 days prior when Jesus was actually crucified. But it's unlikely that all of those, or even most of those to whom Peter's preaching on Pentecost were there that day. It's not that they were literally the ones who crucified Jesus, but there's a collective guilt. It's said, those who said at the crucifixion of Jesus, his blood be on us and on our children, are in fact acting on behalf of everybody, all of us whose sins put Jesus on the cross. Christ had to die for Peter's sins that day too. But Peter is making a point in this sermon of saying, whom you crucified pointing out the guilt of the people that are there. You know, there's lots of virtue signaling going on these days. I can't stand it, I'm sorry. The NFL, my bank, my investment company, they're all coming out with statements saying, you know, we favor uh, social justice and they all have to show how great they are. It's our human nature to always want to compare ourselves to everybody else and point out to everyone how righteous we are, how good we are. Uh, that's, that's part of our human nature, self-justification. Well, let's not go any further than just this one thing for now. Well, however good you might be, whatever good things you may have done, let's make no mistake, you crucified Jesus. He had to go to the cross for you. There's no way around that for any of us. And there's no good thing we can offer up from ourselves or from our lives to make amends for that. Let's look more at Peter's portrait of Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised one, the deliverer. Go to verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth was a man, you see. But as this unfolds, you discover he's portrayed unlike any other man that has ever been or ever will be. God attested to him with mighty works and wonders and signs. And then verse 23, he was this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge, the one that you crucified. So it's the foreknowledge of God by which Jesus was, was crucified. Peter's the only other one in the Bible that uses that word again in his epistle, the foreknowledge of God in all of this. It's the same uh, in Greek, the same word from which we get our English word prognosis, the idea of some kind of knowledge about what hasn't happened yet. God knew that Jesus would die. It was part of his plan. It was part of his purpose. Jesus wasn't just some guy and God said, hey, hey, I think I could use a guy like that. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we're told that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So God had this all planned and set even before he created Adam, even before Adam sinned, even before any of us existed or sinned. It was all part of the plan. But even when things happen exactly the way God intends them, both in history and in our personal life, Peter says, you crucified by the hands of lawless men. In other words, those who committed the evil are still 
held accountable. Well, how can everything happen according to God's plan, and yet God still holds me accountable for the things that I do wrong? That doesn't seem fair. Well, that's the way it is. Verse 24, God not only had him crucified, but raised him up and loosed the pangs of death. And it was impossible that he could have been held by death. Are you getting the picture of this Jesus of Nazareth? That he was not only a man, he was crucified and he was resurrected. Verses 25 to 28, Peter then quotes David in Psalm 16. Now read through that as I'm talking to you here. And what you see there is a clear prophecy that God's Holy One could not stay dead. But in verse 29, Peter shows them that David, who wrote that, was in fact dead and buried. And so his words in Psalm 16, when he had written them a thousand years before this, were not about himself, but they were prophetic of Christ. Verse 31, he, meaning David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. So since Jesus was the one that had been resurrected, Jesus was God's Christ. But wait, there's more. I'm like the Ron Popeil of preaching. Look at verse 33. He's been exalted to the right hand of God. Now, it's kind of fun getting my little granddaughter, Savannah, stay with us. And I've noticed that when she sits in her high chair and eats, she usually grabs for her food with her left hand. I think she's going to be a lefty, like her, like her dad. And I've been working here for four years. I think I just noticed a few months ago, Nadine is a lefty. So, so no offense to all of you who are, are lefties. Don't take this the wrong way. You're better bowlers than we are. So, you know, don't get mad about this. But to sit at the right hand of God... That is the place of the highest honor in the whole universe. And that is where Christ has been seated. And he has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Look at right here in this verse on Trinity Sunday. You've got the Father. You've got the Son who's seated at his right hand. And you have the Holy Spirit. All in one verse. And get this. This is really important, brothers and sisters. Look at the second part of verse 33. He, that is Jesus, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Remember that this whole thing, this Pentecost sermon, has come about because of the rush of wind and the divided tongues of fire and the speaking in tongues and all the people gathering to see what's going on and all of that stuff. And so Peter has given this sermon, and in the first half of the sermon, which we read for you last week, Peter told them that what they were observing and hearing was the fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel where God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. But if you go back to that prophecy in Joel chapter 2, it is abundantly clear who is speaking. It is Yahweh who is speaking. God himself who says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And now Peter, here in verse 33, is telling us that it is Jesus who is pouring out the Spirit. Do you see that? It's an unmistakable identification between Jesus, the Christ, and Yahweh himself. In other words, the Father and the Son, as persons in the Trinity, they, they do different things. There's a distinction between them at the, at the same time. There is a sameness between them both are fully revealed as fully God. So that's the Christ that we have. And now he uses that explanation to transition from Christ's place at the right hand of God and pouring out the Spirit into this idea that Jesus is Lord. And that's saying a different thing, that Jesus is Lord, from saying that he is Christ. So in verse 34, you see there that Peter notes that David did not ascend, and so he quotes another psalm of David, Psalm 110, to show that the Lord has ascended to the place of honor. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now what does that mean? 
Well, it's not as evident for us here in the English, unfortunately. But if you could look at it, you would see that the psalm actually uses two different words which are both translated into English as Lord. And so the Lord, the subject of the sentence there, that word is the word for Yahweh, the proper name for God in the Old Testament, the one and true only God. So Yahweh said to my Lord, the one to whom Yahweh is speaking now is Adonai. It's another word that's usually used for the Lord, usually to God, but it's a little bit broader. So it's Yahweh speaking to this Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now David knew that God had promised that one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. And David knew that it was not he himself. So David speaks of God, Yahweh, saying this to whom? To David's own descendant. And so David calls him Lord because even though he is David's son, a descendant of David, he is greater than David. Now watch this. Peter closes the sermon with verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter has explained how Jesus is the Christ, chosen and sent by God to die and to be raised again. And he's explained how Jesus is the Lord, the one who has received all honor in the universe, and whose enemies, whether they be immaterial things like death and hell or emptiness, or whether they be personal beings like the devil or demons or people who are in rebellion against God, but all of his enemies will be placed under his feet and brought into final submission to his authority. And the reason this is so powerful for Peter's sermon here is because then it ties back to the first part of the sermon, what we read for you last week. So I see why you got to come to church or listen to them on the live stream because you got to get this stuff from week to week. Do you remember that prophecy from Joel that Peter mentioned in last week's text? That prophecy also warns that the giving of God's Spirit would be an indicator of final judgment. That judgment was now impending. There would be blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun would be turned to darkness and the moon would be turned to blood. Remember that stuff? Remember? Before the day of the Lord would come. The day of the Lord is an idiom in the Old Testament, meaning the day of judgment. The day when God says, all right, this is it. We're going to fix everything and square it all away. The day, that great and wonderful, great and dreadful day. And then there is the last verse that he quotes from the prophecy in Joel. What's going to happen in that day of judgment? It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so Peter, at the end of his sermon, has tied this whole thing together by making sure that we know who is the Lord in whom on whom we must call to be saved. Why, it's Jesus. This Jesus. Amen. On Trinity Sunday, it's traditional that we confess the Athanasian Creed, which is the longest of the creeds, but really drives to the heart of the importance of the Trinitarian faith. And it's printed in your bulletins for you uh, in a responsive reading way. So I'm going to invite you to stand and join with me in, as we confess this, uh, what has been believed by all Christians in all times. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Catholic faith is this. That we worship one God, the Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. For the Godhead of the Father is the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is the Son, the glory equal, the majesty of the Holy Eternal. 
such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, and the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated, nor three infants, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, and the Holy Spirit Almighty. And yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also we are prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created, not begotten, but received. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And it is a certainty, none is before or after another, none is greater or the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe in that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born of the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by the unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again from the dead. Ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And his son and all people will rise again with their eyes, and they will come to serve their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. You may be seated for the prayer. <laughs> we bless you, Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ask that you hear the prayers of your people and grant to us all things according to your word and your promise. In the beginning, your word spoke all things into being, and from nothing you have made all that is. Help us to see the imprint of your love in the goodness in creation. Help us to be responsible in our care for all that you have entrusted to us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And through the ages, Father, your Son has filled the sin-stained world with hope and called us to repentance and faith. Help us to hear the voice of your word and to respond with faith, confessing you without fear before all people and in every corner of the earth, as you planned long before the world began, deliver us in Christ, 
that we might be your own and live according to your commandments all of our days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. In government and law, O oh Father, it was your intent that we have order, that the weak would be protected, that godly virtue would be fostered. And so we pray for all of our leaders, our president, our governors, our legislators, our judges, our administrators, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would work in them to do what is right. We pray, O oh Lord, as we see sinister things at work in our country, and we discover that we are, in fact, from so many directions, under spiritual attack, and that we are, are feeling the force and the weight of sin constantly driving us away from you. Restore and encourage, O oh Lord, the desire for what is righteous outwardly in your sight. Deliver our society from the threats of pandemic, from tyranny, from oppression, Lord, from lawlessness and chaos and anarchy. And bless, Lord, those who are members of our armed forces and those of our police departments who keep us safe. Bless those who work in the emergency fields and the medical arena who help take care of us when we are sick. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would care for us and bless us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And in our hour of trial and our moment of trouble, we ask that you would be present with us. And we cry unto you in prayer for those who are sick and those who are troubled. We remember before you especially today little four-year-old Colin, who has not responded to the many treatments that he has received and is not doing well. Oh God, take him into your hands and grant him what we humbly ask, your healing power. We pray, Lord, for the family of Clyde, Carol's dad, who passed this morning from life into death. We ask that for the sake of Jesus Christ, who in baptism called him to be your own, we ask that he would be escorted from death to life, and that his family would be encouraged. We pray, O oh Lord, for Tim, who's suffering with Parkinson's disease and has had terrible muscle spasms lately. We ask, O oh God, that you would work in his life to bring restoration, to bring relief, to bring reassurance that your love for him is not contingent on anything in this world, but is eternal. We pray, Lord, for Glenn, who struggled so much with hospitalizations and with issues related to his heart and his blood pressure. We ask, O oh God, that you would raise him up and strengthen his life and help him, Lord, to feel well inside and out and to feel in the word of God your presence and your voice speaking to him. We pray, Lord, for Donna Schaefer, our sister in the Lord, who again had a recent hospitalization in his home. And Lord, she's in for a long haul in recovery. We ask that you would surround her, that you would hear our prayers to target, Lord, like a missile, your healing power and strength into her life. We pray, Lord, for these and all others that we named you in our hearts that you would deliver us according to your good providence and your gracious will, but that all might be sustained by a hope and a patient heart as we wait for that day when those whom you have made your own will receive their reward. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things and whatever else, Lord, you know that we need, we ask that you would grant to us that for the sake of Jesus Christ and uh, in unity with the Father and the Holy Spirit, we would experience your spiritual blessings. And to you then be all honor and glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. 